Oh, well, everyone else uh, joins. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to another Codacy talk, this time about code quality and open source. So my name is Eloisa. I'm with the marketing team at Codacy, and I'll be introducing this session to you. So I'm here with Codacy CEO, Jaime Jorge, uh, who will be moderating the discussion itself uh, with our guest speaker, Niels Lohmann, uh, an engineering leader who created and still maintains the 15th most starred C++ project on GitHub, open source project on GitHub. So more about this in a moment. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Um, they're going to be talking about their real world experience uh, with open source and how to maintain code quality as the project grows, as more contributors emerge, uh, and, that's, and why that's so important in open source. Um, so as always, we'll have a Q&A at the end of, the, of this session, so you can save your questions and feel free to ask anything near the end. Um, before we start, I want to do a quick poll with all of you. So if you can just answer the poll that's going to pop up in your screen right now, it's about, you know, we want to know if you're currently involved in any open source project right now. Okay. We'll, we'll end the poll. Uh, I can tell you that most people right here with us right now uh, said that yes, they do contribute to uh, an open source project. Some people have also managed an open source project. So that's pretty cool. I'm gonna end the poll. Uh, without further ado, I would love our guests to introduce themselves. So I'll let them uh, talk now and introduce themselves. Uh, over to Jaim. Great. Can you hear me well, Eliza? Now I can. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, thanks everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Eliza, for the introduction. I'm Jaime Georges. I'm CEO and co-founder of Codacy. Uh, we're building the DevOps intelligence platform uh, for the world of software development. Um, and, you know, this is part of the, the, a series of webinars that uh, we're trying to give spotlight to people to people building software essentially. So um, today we're very excited uh, to welcome Niels Lohmann, um, a navigation engineering lead at Ambition, a subsidiary of Mercedes-Benz. Uh, but most importantly for our talk today, um, the creator of JSON, a C++ uh, JSON library. And as Eloisa said, uh, it's the 15th most starred C++ project in all of GitHub with 31.3 thousand stars, uh, more than 300 contributors, uh, which I believe to be larger than 80% of startups in terms of if we were just counting as employees um, and used by some of the largest uh, tech companies out there. So in full disclosure, Codacy is actually a sponsor of this project. And so we're quite happy about that. And um, I was just checking as we start um, you know, our conversation, Niels, that, that the first commit, the first commit was in, on, on July 4th, 2013. So I guess my first question as you introduce yourself is what motivated you to start, um, this project? Yes. Hello. Thanks for introduction. Um, I, back in the day I started, uh, I was working in a university and we built a lot of software in C++. And we needed some way to shoot some JSON back to a server. And uh, we had no library for that because at that time we didn't need a library because it was very simple. But then it started to get complicated. We had to escape strings. We had to add commas to properly have lists. And this emerged to be uh, some code that has been reused in different projects at university. And at some point, it was time to give it a new home. And uh, I, I wanted to always try out open source and I wanted to try out GitHub. I knew it as a place to download stuff, but never really contributed or uploaded something. And it was also the time where C++ 11 became more popular. And uh, there was a book coming out by uh, Scott Myers called uh, Effective Modern C++ and Modern C++ back in the day, Modern Men C++ 11 and later C++ 14. And I was looking for a name, and as computer scientists are terrible with naming things, I came up with, call it JSON for modern C++, and I tried to put in as much C++11 features I could to, to educate myself and created this project. Um, I, I looked it up. 
The first commit was indeed in July. Uh, in the same month, we had the first release candidate, but the first release itself was only in December. So it took another six months before uh, I was ready to call it 1.00. And uh, now it's at version 3.11.2 released uh, last week so it has it has evolved and it's been a long time now that's fantastic and and we do have a, a list of, of questions that we prepared uh, beforehand but as as you're describing the start of the journey i'm curious like when did you see the adoption start exploding when, when was that moment i um there was not never this eureka moment where someone mentioned it on a popular place and people started downloading it it was rather, if you take the stars from GitHub as some kind of metric, and it's not the best metric because a star can mean anything. It can mean good job, but it can also mean I, I should not forget this project or something. Um, the growth was like, it's, it's linear. So uh, in, it's really a line starting from zero going up to 30,000, but there, there's not a, a moment where it goes exponentially or where it's a jump. Sometimes there's a bit of a jump, after a release when there's some discussion in, in Reddit or at some forum where more people get noticing, noticing it, but it, there, there was never a moment. It's, it's really, if, if I would know what I did, then I could write a book and get rich or something. But right now it's, it seems it's just a matter over time that people are looking for it. I, I may have found a niche at that point. There, was no, there, there were JSON libraries, but they were a bit more difficult to use. And it seems that I found a place that has some natural growth. It eventually it will decline, but right now it's just people are happy with it. I'm happy with working on it. So I think that's the reason why it keeps growing. That's fantastic. And, and you said something that now speak, uh, spiked my interest. Why, why do you think it will decline? Sorry, why? Wait, so why, why do you think it will decline? Just out of, out of curiosity. Well, um, I'm, I'm never sure what comes up with C++. So Google recently uh, an, announced that they now work with Carbon and I'm not saying that they would abandon C++, but it could be, I don't know, if now someone has something that works well with Carbon, then I guess people just, why should any software developer be loyal to a, a library that, have, that they have been using for a while if something better comes around? And at the same time, it could be that JSON itself could getting less interested less interest than other formats come up. So I'm not planning to do whatever it takes to defend this. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's a hobby project and I like that people are using it. Fantastic. Okay. Well, that's a great start to the conversation. Um, and, and, and let's go for the first question that we have here, um, which kind of mirrors, and, 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 and one of the reasons why I find it so interesting is, is that it's an open source project, but it does have to have quality. Right. Otherwise, people won't adopt it, and 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 that's extremely important. So, in your view, Niels, what's the biggest challenge to maintaining code quality in 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 JSON? There are a lot of challenges. Um, um, where to start? I think the first one is the first challenge to see is that uh, code quality is nothing where people stop by in a project if they want to contribute. So. Um, usually when I see contributors coming along, they either have some bug that they want to fix. So they, they already have a project, they're trying stuff, it's not working, or they, they lack a feature and they propose a new feature. And usually they work until it's working and they open a pull request and that's it. Very often they say, it works on my machine. Here's a pull request. Good luck, goodbye, and they're gone. And the whole code quality thing is then left to the maintainers. It's it's basically my job to make sure that it, it runs. And I can't go to volunteers and ask them, well, you well, I can try, but if a volunteer provides a feature but doesn't write documentation or doesn't write a unit test or doesn't care about warnings, then I'm out of luck. I can't push anyone. So eventually it's my job. And that's the challenge. It's not like, a company where we literally pay people to do stuff that uh, we can motivate people this way. So um, that's one challenge. Then very often contributors have no idea about the bigger picture. So they come along, they provide their stuff. And then you say, well, this may not work with Windows, this version, this compiler. And they didn't even know that this was a thing, that this was important. And 
then again, the challenge is that it's not entirely clear what people expect or what I expect for people to come by. And um, the solution I found for this, I mean, not talking about challenges, also for maybe solutions, I found it's very easy to have a CI reject pull requests and say automatically, listen, if this doesn't build in Windows, here's a documentation missing and there's a compiler warning because then it's not me being the, the guy with the bad news. I can be the guy that say, thank you very much. Unfortunately, there's, there's a red cross here and maybe you want to fix this, et cetera. And it saves a lot of discussion and it makes it more clear what to expect and where to go. That, that's one part. Really, the people stopping by, they want to get their things done and they're not coming for quality. The second thing is C++. I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, C++ is, C++ 11 is old, but it's still not properly supported in all the compilers used today. Um, a lot of companies have decided to use one version of compilers. Maybe that is the only certified one or they cannot upgrade for some, some reason. And then suddenly you can't just say, oh, update, it works in the new version. So you have to support a lot of stuff that you don't even know that it exists. And that is a challenge because in any other company, you would, it would be much easier to, to somehow have a discussion about only supporting a few compilers, but we have to support a lot. Uh, then again, the, the language is moving for, uh, further. So suddenly C++ 20 comes along and suddenly old code is breaking or you have to make adjustments and it's a lot of moving targets. And the challenge here is we have a lot of variations now, a lot of if devs throughout the code. And when we test, we have to test a lot of configurations. And then again, that's a challenge. It's not this one set of code that you just compile with one compiler and you're done. I really envy the Python guys. <laughs> But it's really uh, you have to have to do a lot of uh, of work, and we now I just wrote it down. We are now testing with fifty three compilers in different configurations, just to at least have an idea where it could break, and uh, that that number is more going up than it's going down. Um, another thing I I already touched upon is we don't know really our customer, so I put a library out there. Um, it's a it's a C++ header that needs to be compiled. So it's not that we ship a pre-built binary, but we ship code. And we have no idea who's using it where. So could be different compilers, could be platforms, different use cases. People use JSON on embedded devices to, to do some logging or diagnostics. Other people write a game and they use JSON as a means to, to store a high score. And other people just want to write a small script that does things. And all these people have different expectations. And whatever we do or whatever we try to do, we are always surprised by people coming up and say, oh, it doesn't work on a PlayStation. We're using that strange version of a C++ compiler at Sony. And suddenly you think, oh, wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and suddenly again, there's one more platform that you have to care about. Um, and one more thing about C++, it's the warnings. Suddenly there's a new compiler adding a warning. People are very pedantic about warnings. They switch on all the levels and suddenly we have to support, we, we are the bad guys. Suddenly our code triggers a warning and in a code base we've never even seen. And people are angry, not angry, but people create bug tickets. And I learned from the bug ticket, oh, there's a new Clang out there, which has a new version, uh, which has a new uh, flag and that's, piling up. So we don't know our customer and uh, working open source in this direction makes me value my day job where it's pretty clear on which <laughs> hardware, on which compiler and when we ship um, because then at least that, that is one whole dimension of, of problems that we try to avoid. But nonetheless, it's, it's fun. I'm an engineer, so I enjoy fixing things and, and working on things, but I would wish it would be less work in that, in that direction. Um, can go on and on. I see, Jamie, you're making of course. notes. Um, no, I put I, one I'm, more thing I'm... on the stack and then I'm done with, uh, with what I have in mind. Um, a last challenge in open source, apparently it's, uh, obviously it's limited resources. So uh, everybody's doing this in their free time. 
And um, it's not that working in a company makes makes you work with unlimited people and unlimited money, but at least it's more than zero. And um, one thing is infrastructure. So the CI that we're using, we're all using this free tiers of GitHub Actions and Jenkins, uh, not Jenkins, and um, Travis and, and AppVay and how they're called. But basically, it's it all can always be more. And in any other company, if you complain about a slow CI, eventually someone opens their wallet and say, let's have another server. You can't have this in open source. Uh, you, you can't delegate things that you don't want to do. So if someone opens an issue that you don't want to work on, it's there forever. And I for can't- For everyone to see, yeah. Yes, for everyone to see, even worse, yes. So that's the last challenge there is. It, it's good that everybody can create an open source project regardless of money or resources. But at the same time, you can't compete with big companies that just have an infinite amount of people that just want to work there and can work on that. So, so much about challenges. It's still fun, but it's a lot of things that are challenging. I find it fascinating. All, all the different challenges that, that are, are so invisible to everyone using the library, but also, you know, working in their, as you, as you mentioned, kind of cozy uh, jobs. It, it's, it's so, I also find it very fascinating that you call your users customers. That's really cool as well, right? It, it shows kind of the seriousness of how you 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 take the the mission, the implied mission of of the of the repo. So that's 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 awesome. Um, and I think the next question also connects to, uh, well with with this, which is more kind of the human element of this. And and I, I took a, a small, I did a small review of some uh, recent presentation you did, and I, I I noticed that you started to also have trolls as you call them people that uh, are not the nicest um when it comes to to looking and to commenting and to raising issues and pull requests and so i guess i guess that connects with this question which is what, what the hardest thing what's the hardest thing about maintaining a group of collaborators in your project knowing particularly difficulty in this so you mentioned 53 compilers tons of warnings that get a, appear with with frequency you know, it's, it's, it must be difficult. It's difficult, but I wouldn't start with the trolls. That's, uh, that's just a limited thing. It's, it's, uh, I, I can tell some anecdotes later, but um, I think the most difficult thing is that people can appear and disappear any day. So you can never guarantee that people stay in the project until some feature is ready or until some release is done. People have limited time. People yeah. mostly do it in their free time. They, even, even if they write some code at work, they, they throw you some patch, you can take it or leave it. And it could be that the next time you have a question, they just disappear. And this brings a challenge that if I try to take over code, it's not just about, does it run? Is it nice? But I always have to ask myself, uh, can I fix future bugs in this piece of code in two years? And usually the answer is maybe not. And then I'm, you hesitate a lot. And then it's about, oh, could you please write a bit more documentation? You really need to understand. I, I feel myself like a, like a novice asking so many questions because in the outside, it could be perfect. Nice tests, nice documentation, but the code itself can be so clever that I'm afraid that I will never be able to debug it. And that's the problem because then again, people come and go, most of them, most of the people that come eventually go. Um, I only have a few people that are with us for a long time. And um, yeah, that's that's a problem. And it's not that like in companies where people give you notice and you you can organize a handover and and you can plan somehow. That's I think that's the, the biggest problem I see right now when it comes to people. Um, then of course you have the same problem you have everywhere with people, communication. The moment there are more than two people, or the moment there are one more than one people, you have to communicate. And in software projects, it's most of I think in 99% it's written communication. So a lot of source for misunderstanding, hardly any native speakers. So it's difficult. And um, we recently create uh, moved to some of the communication to a Discord channel that at least it's easier to quickly communicate without leaving this 
paper trail forever in, a, in, a, in an issue in GitHub. Um, GitHub itself is a problem because GitHub is not the best tool to organize communities. It's a great tool to host software and to organize that, but it's, it's terrible to, to communicate. It's not a communication platform, yet still you do have a lot of communications and issues. And yeah, there are discussions added recently to, to the GitHub uh, feature set, but then they don't really have threads and it's not helping. So yeah, I guess the, one of the biggest challenges as a maintainer is to make sure that those people who come and go can have a very productive time and can focus on developing. And basically I can make sure that I ask them all the questions I need to have before they disappear. Um, yeah, then the trolls, yes. <laughs> Sometimes there are people who are, can be very, very, um, how to say, not just serious. They take everything personally. So it's about um, C++ is used by a lot of people that value performance above anything else. And if they have the feeling that something is slow, they immediately get very angry and personal and they threaten you that they go to a different library, which for me is not a threat. I mean, it's I put stuff for free on the internet and someone threatens me not to use my free stuff. It's okay. But um, when you start, and it, it depends when you're doing stuff, when you work on a release for a long time, and then it's out there and there are bugs in it. And then people, yeah, are not too nice and only focus on the bad things and not on good things. And it could be that this ruins your day and that you're very angry or at least very disappointed. But I realize with a growing community, I can ignore stuff. I don't need to be that guy who needs to listen, maybe sleep a night over it and then react. I can ignore it and maybe have other people react on that. So the troll problem is, is, uh, is solved more or less. Uh, a particular funny part of trolling was the Hacktoberfest at GitHub. So every October, well, in the past years, project, people could come by make a pull request on a project. And then once it was approved, they could get a t-shirt from, I think, directly GitHub or some other company. And um, that is nice if people actually fix things, but if people just come around to add white space to your readme file and just hope that I'm stupid enough to merge it so they get a t-shirt, that's a form of vandalism that I really didn't like. And um, yeah, now, now it's possible to exclude yourself from this because I never made Good experience with that. Um, another thing for maintaining a group of collaborators is expectation management. Um, when I started the project a long time ago, I was so happy when the first pull request came in. I unfortunately have forgotten what it was, but it was really something, I don't know, adding a test or fixing some warning. And I was so delighted that there are people out there who wanted to help me. and it's at some point you have to learn to say no. At some point, people make a proposal that is not fitting your mindset or that is not fitting the idea that you have for the library down the road in the next years. And it was very difficult for me to understand that it's okay to just say no. That it's a pull request doesn't mean you have to merge it. A pull request can also mean I can close it and say, this is not fitting. And that took a long time to understand and uh, yeah, this whole expectation management means a lot of communication, what could go in the library and what not. People come and say, look at this function because at our company, we need that function. And then you look at it and say, well, you may be like half a percent that find this relevant, but what about the other people? They may be confused by yet another function. And yeah, if you really need this, implemented a different way, I, I'm not going to support this. I'm not, I'm not going to be that guy who writes tests for your function that you dropped here without tests, without anything. And yeah, that's, uh, it's, you have to learn to say no. That's, that's one of the, the hardest thing about uh, working with collaborators. Yeah, particularly with with the as, as the audience grew, right? Obviously it does not, it's not productive or sustainable. 
Yes. Um, for, for, for our audience, I took just a few notes to, to summarize it, right? So make it productive for them to be collaborators in the project. Um, invest in documentation, uh, not only before, but also as people and ask tons of questions when people are adding to, to the repo. Uh, communication, ignoring trolls and expectation management. So um, I think these are excellent tips for, for yeah. people that want to... One one more aspect about uh, documentation. Um, I think in the past two releases, I spent most of the time just writing documentation. So other people did the feature stuff. I did documentation. At some point, it's an investment. It's for every page of documentation I write. I, for the future, have a URL that I can send to other people instead of having to write the same answer over and over again. And at some point, you can really make people how to say they shouldn't feel stupid but at, at least they should feel like oh sorry i haven't seen that and before they're like i don't understand it please explain it to me and when you have a, a lot of documentation at some point people say all right i can serve myself i can i can research i can read it and then they only come to me if there's still some things that are not clear or where the english is broken and really nobody can uh, but me can understand the sentence and then People can can help, but that's an investment that I learned in the past year. That at some point you should stop adding features. You really have to invest into documentation, because that in the end makes the difference between a project that people want to use and a project where people keep have looking up stuff in the code, writing a lot of issues. So yeah, documentation is is so important. I wouldn't say it's more important than tests and and everything, but at some point there's a point where you should stop writing more code and stop writing more features, but really focus on writing down what you want to achieve and what you did achieve. It's also good to celebrate a bit, to really be able to, to write down why it works, that it works and which situations can work. That also what was for me a bit eye-opening to see how many things just work out of the box. And, and because there was a, people write, right um bug issue say it doesn't work in this and that situation and then you know it works you can do this and that but once you collect these bug tickets where you never fix the code but just explained how it works and put this into documentation this piles up then eventually you you have a feature for the library by just explaining things that work out of the box and that that for me was also interesting to see how much is already in there and you just need to write it down fascinating fascinating stuff and, and the more we speak uh and the more i hear you Niels, the, the more there's a a strong parallel to actually to, to being a company like so many things here are interesting and the next question is 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 is, is, is there's a big parallel to that as well um which is has, has there been any difficult moment where um, Jason affected enterprise production environments, particularly given um, the, the impressive list of, of companies using uh, the project? I, unfortunately not. I, I wish I had some anecdote about this, but so far companies are usually one of the best customers, so to say I have. Usually they're very polite, they never have very loud support requests. And if I get merge requests from them, uh, they're very high quality. It's it's as if they already patched the library and have a patch running in production for a while. And at some point I get the feeling that some someone had enough of updating a patch and just sends it in. And usually this is a, a no brainer. You look at it and say, yes, of course, thanks a lot. And so far, my communication was, to me, visible companies. Of course, if people are using their private GitHub accounts and troll and et cetera, I, I, I wouldn't know which company that is. But so far, everything is perfect. It's really nice. And at times when I do a release and I think about how many scripts run and automatically pull the new release and put it into some production, I... I wouldn't say I'm afraid, but I, I, I really have respect for that. But then I remember, I, I looked it up, the first sentence of the MIT license, which states the software is provided as is without warranty of any kind. 
So then I can say, okay, you you got what you paid for. You 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 downloaded free stuff on the internet, and please don't bug me if it doesn't work. So yes, so far it's fine. I know that uh, JSON uh, is used in the company that I'm working in. It's used in other companies where I know that, where people are working on, but so far I only know by anecdote that they're using it. It's never that they come to me and say, good that I know you, I, here's a support request, et cetera. It's just, I know after the fact that people tell me, I used to work at that and that company and yes, we're using your library for quite a while. And then it's like, can you tell me anything about it? And they say, no, we're using it, it full stop. So it's boring, but I think that's that's a good thing. <laughs> that's 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 cool and, and it's, it's actually, it's great that there hasn't been any 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 problem. But then let, let me switch the question. Has there been? How do you celebrate? Like obviously in documentation, you take you take a moment to to celebrate versions. But um, how do you celebrate with the the collaborators that you have? H have you met some of them in person? No, that's really unfortunate because um, th there are a lot of a lot of sites where you can get some intelligence or insights where people are coming from. There are a lot of contributors from the US and with COVID, it's difficult to travel and I don't have budget to just meet these guys, but um, unfortunately not. I hope that now you moving to Discord, at least it's it's a bit easier to, to get into contact, but so far, no. Um, but I, from just writing with these people, it's it's amazing to, to know that these people are doing this in their free time. And I think that's so unique for, well, maybe other professions have it as well, but I, I think I'm talking to people who spend 10 days every day writing software for money, then go home, have dinner, and then sit down and writing software for fun. And that's that's amazing. But I also have the feeling that some people are not there to socialize. They they really want to get things done. They want to, they just want to do something. They just want to code. They want to improve things. And it's I, I guess it's not the place where they hang out and, and make friends, but if there would be a possibility, I would really like to get in, in contact with all those guys. And uh, if you go to the readme page of the project, I have a list of contributors. It's not auto-generated. I do it by hand where I really try to write down who's doing what. And there are so many people just adding a comma, fixing a typo, doing stuff. And it's so, I really like that. It's, it's, it's really nice to see, as you say, some companies have fewer employees than contributors in open source project, but I guess it's over time, it's it's never the same amount of people active. It's always a few, but over time, it's it's getting a bigger and bigger list. That's that's really great. That's fantastic. And 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 as we as we think about that culture, and obviously we already touched a little bit on this as as we go into to to our next question, um, is you know, how, how would you compare the culture in terms of producing software? As you mentioned, these, these are, these, this is a group of people that work in software throughout their days and they go home and they write software for fun, which is, you know, amusing, right? So it, think about how many other professions actually do this, right? They, they continue their work or, 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 or other work, right? Doing the same, the same profession at, at home. Um, so, so culturally you already touched some of these elements, right? So, so it's, it's, people can leave at any moment. So you can expect sometimes very little, there's no obligation. Um, exactly. beyond that, how, what do you, how do you compare that? How do you compare that with your day job? I, I'm very fortunate that I'm working with a very good team of people where I can also say a lot of people really do things for fun. It's it's not that point of time where I have the feeling that only the money that the company is paying, bringing the people together. Of course, that's a, a big part of that, but I, I have the privilege to work with people who, who really like what they're doing, but in open source, it's amazing where people, that people are able to, to motivate themselves for quite a long time. I, I have one, one feature, two features. Um, where people worked over half a year or one, I think even a year on one feature, they had a pull request open for such a long time and they had to fix so much. It was really a, a core feature that makes the libraries. Uh, in, in JSON, you can, with very little effort, have arbitrary JSON 
uh, JSON class. C++ classes or structs compare, uh, converted to JSON and back. And that feature only needs, you only need to implement two functions and you get it for free. And to me, even now it's magic that it works. It's C++. It's a lot of things that are really complicated, but that guy spent so much time bringing it in and there were so many edge cases and eventually it was ready. And eventually that person disappeared, but he decided I want to have that feature in and I do whatever it takes until it's ready. And I would have merged the stuff so much earlier because I said, well, let's have it a beta feature. If it's not working, at least we have something to build upon. But he said, no, I like it's my name on it. I want to have it in. Let's have it. And that's that's amazing. And this is also I have a different contributor who implemented a binary format. So he had to implement a parser that accepts some vector of bytes. And if this vector of bytes happens to be correct input, then he gets JSON out of that, but it's way more compressed. We're using Google OSS Fuzz, which is a project where uh, Google is having uh, running a lot of servers that generate 24 seven Fuzz input. And Google was breaking his code again and again and again. So he, he had his merge request open, we reviewed it, we merged it. He said, we said, congratulations, now it's finally done. And 24 hours later, I got an email from from Google, here's an input, like here are 17 bytes that crashes the library because of some edge cases we haven't looked at. And I reopened the ticket, I added this thing, he apologized, I said, there's no need to apologize, we reviewed it, we didn't see it. And every time I thought, this is the last time I see that guy, because eventually he's fed up. He doesn't <laughs> want to. But now Google is leaving us alone for a month now, so it's, it's stable enough that Google can't break it. So. Then again, people are so motivated by knowing that they can do it. I think for them, it's also a challenge. It's they're spending their free times like doing crossword puzzles. They say, I'm a C++ programmer in my free time. I want to implement that feature there. And I, I wouldn't be a good C++ programmer if I can't do this. And maybe they start with, it's an evening of time. Maybe they then say it's a week. But some people say half a year, no problem. I can do that. And they... That's just amazing. And I, I wouldn't know how to do this with any motivation other than a lot of money. But even then, I'm not sure if I had the same responsiveness, the same kind of communication where people are just positive and say, let's fix that, no problem. Um, but it's the same for me. I'm doing it for myself also not to please anybody. It's just I'm, I'm doing whenever I have time to do this. But... Uh, it's not that I'm doing it for some people. It's not that anyone writes me a piece of paper where I can go to a company and say, look, I did that. Please give me a raise. Please hire me. It's, it's just people are doing it just for fun. And this kind of motivation is always amazing. As I said, I'm privileged that I can see this at work uh, very often, but I think it's, it's a whole different story. Nobody's writing open source project with a bad mood. I, I I wouldn't believe that, that people just hate that and still doing it. They, they wouldn't do it. Um, as a downside, I see a lot of discussions. And those kind of discussions that it's very hard to put an end to it. On the one hand, it's good. You have this freedom. It's not that I have a milestone plan where I have the next four quarters planned out and I know exactly what I'm doing in, in, in week number 21 in 2024. It's, I, I can, if someone comes around and say, listen, here's some kind of performance improvement. It's not that I look in my milestone plan and say, okay, let's have this next year. I say, good, create a merge request, let's go. But at the same time, people come around and say, well, ever heard about YAML or XML? Wouldn't this be something you would like to see in the library? And then you discuss and say, no, really, it's not fitting. And then these kind of discussions is something that I don't have in my professional work where people questioning the whole scope of the project again and again, and where no discussion is, well, in, in open source, I have the feeling no discussion is ever op uh, over because new people come over, they don't know the state of the past discussions, so they ask the same questions again. And yeah, that's you have to be very patient to 
remind yourself of the arguments that you wrote down in the past. And then again, we're back at documentation. You have to write down why you reject which feature. So if people come back again, you can point them to a page and say, well, listen, these kind of things are out of scope. These things are explicitly out of scope because we had this discussion and we say no. And um, then again, if you don't do this, then people have different expectations what could be the next steps. And yeah, then again, it's the freedom. I enjoy the freedom, but at the same time, it opens all kinds of discussions about everything. And with everything, I mean everything. People can be so emotional about so many other things that <laughs> yeah, that's difficult. Yeah, and we spoke about the trolls. I, I haven't seen trolls at work yet, uh, but uh, you find them in the, in, in the internet. And yeah, it's, as I said, it's something that, that it's easier to cope with if more people are working on the project. Yeah, tremendous answer. And so as, as we get to our, our final um, question, my, uh, there's a conclusion here that I take. So you have customers you do support, you have trolls, you have growth, uh, which is very much linear like many startups as well. You have a core team, um, you're dealing with motivation and culture and all these elements. So many of these things if you know, could be considered a company. So uh, as we get to the final slide, um, how do you balance, how do you do personally balance um, managing almost a whole company which is you know you have collaborators you have so much uh, technology to manage as well and so so much load as well right so we're, we're talking about uh, 53 compilers tons of warnings um different um elements to this um, that 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 create complexity how do you do that how do you balance your day job with um with this mission I I don't think it's that much of work. I, you describe it as if it's, this would be a lot of work if I would do it this all the time, every time next to my job. But the good thing is I only do it when I want to. And this is also something that I learned that there are times where I really don't want to work on the project for different reasons. And it's perfectly okay not to. And it's not that anyone has my private number and calls me up and say, get back to work. It's just, it's okay not to look at, I mean, I have, I can filter my email for anything from GitHub and then I, I have a quiet time. It's, it's fine. And uh, that is one thing. So the luxury to say I'm working in bursts, there are times where I work a lot and then there are times where I do hardly anything. And that works well with my family and everything. So there are times where I really have no time for doing this. And at other times, it's a good way to relax, to just work on this, but nobody forces me. And that's, then again, that's a privilege that I don't think, I mean, you should know, running a company, I don't think that you can say, oh, I'm not feeling like running a company in the next five weeks or so. So that's that's one thing that I can can see what I can do in which time. And one thing that I learned is also that, the stuff that I'm doing in the project should never be the same thing than doing at work. So if at work, I write C++ code and really go deep down into algorithms, then I don't go home and do the same in the JSON library. That's a time where if I want to do something, I write documentation or I write some JSON script and vice versa. If my, if my day job is, if I'm in, in so many meetings and I only write emails and I haven't seen an IDE all day, then it's nice to open an IDE and write some code. And even if it's not really mind blowing algorithms, but just having the feeling that I spend some time with a the compiler, then that, that's also good if you have a way to do this. So I would, for this, I would really like to see whether other projects see it themselves, whether maintainers of big Python projects have a Python day job or whether they also do something else. I don't know. Um, but that for me is, is something that I learned. And as I said, learning to say no is very important to just say, if your expectation is to have this in, please fork the project, edit, but you, can, you can't force me. That's, that's one, one of the things where I see it. Fantastic. I think that's a great end to our set of questions. And, and 
I would love if we go, if we could get some 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 questions from the audience. Are there any questions, Eloisa? Okay, yeah, let's jump to the Q and A. We have two questions, so waiting for Niels to answer. I think these are both for Niels. Um, so first question, I'm just gonna read it. Do you regularly get hard to reproduce bugs in the C++, C++ code? Um, yes. <laughs> The thing is, of course, once you have analyzed the bug in the end, it all looks easy. Um, but very often, these are bugs where from the start, it's not entirely clear which compiler has been used and which other project is around it. A lot of people come from their day jobs where they, of course, can't share the whole project. So it takes a time digging in. We found some compiler bugs in the project, which is always the worst because you get trained that it's never the compiler's fault if something is wrong until it is the compiler's fault. And then you always think, oh, it's not my code. It's probably a bug in the compiler. And that's always difficult to, to know when to expect which. But this hard to reproduce bugs, fortunately, no, because the library is not using threads, which is always a source of problems. And the library is hardly using any pointers. So it's not that memory management is a problem. So when it comes to this hard C++ stuff, we try to get away from that and let it outside the code base. So no, the biggest challenge is always to understand what people are doing until they see the problem. And very oftentimes they figure if they start removing their own code, the, the, the bug goes away. And then they figured if they remove the library, the bug is, is still there, so it can't be the library. Okay, got it. Uh, the second question is, so do you think initiatives like GitHub sponsors will someday help fund maintainers completely? So if you had the chance, would you work full time on this project? Um, I don't know. Um, I see, I, I get some money from GitHub sponsors and I, I really yeah. appreciate that. And um, as it was said that also, uh, you are sponsoring uh, some of the library, but I really don't know if this is something where it, it where to start. As I said, a lot of people have a day job writing software, and usually these kind of day jobs are well paid. And to quit the day job to go open source full time and to depend on something like GitHub sponsors, where you can end your sponsorship every day, so you can. You can start, I'll sponsor you with a thousand dollars every every month, but you can cancel the sponsorship after the first month. That to me would be too difficult to plan with. So I don't know. Um, but at the same time, I would like to see more companies think about the kind of software that they're using every day. Um, and to think about how much how much effort they don't need to do because other people are doing it. Then again, I'm well aware about the license that I'm using. I'm basically giving away the software for free and it, no, I can't expect anyone to do pay me for anything. So it's, it's a difficult situation. I wish people would give back more, but it's not happening. So I don't know. Um, if I had the chance, would I work full time on your project? I frankly wouldn't know. It would depend on what kind of things I would like to do in that time. But right now, I have the feeling, since I write so much documentation and doing so much support, I frankly wouldn't like to do this every day, each day, because then I have the feeling I, 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 stop, work, I, I stop working as a programmer and I start working as, as a support person, which is nothing that I like doing. So, yeah. That was a tough question to answer. Thank you. Um, so there's one more. We, we're getting a few questions, so good. Let's move on. How do people normally react when their contribution is rejected? Emotionally, emotional. Um, very often when we reject, I say we because there are some other contributors that help a lot. Um, when we have a discussion, it's it's usually not the point where we do this out of the blue. It's that we explain that the change has a bigger impact than the contributors may have 
seen. And usually if, if we have a CI that complains a lot, we say, well, we told you it's not going to work. So here are concrete examples that show you that it's not working this way. Usually things are then rejected if nothing happens. If people are not working on this thing, then eventually the pull request um, needs to be rebased because so much other things going on. And if this is happening, if, if, if a merge request that cannot be merged and has a red CI, if this is around for a month or two, then we close it. And then people come back and say like, why? I worked so much stuff and then uh, I worked so hard for such a long time. That is, that is one thing. Um, other people are quite, um, how to say, they take it easy. It's, it's, I take a longer time writing a polite response that after long consideration, I think this is not a proper contribution, yada, yada, and give a lot of reasons. They react fine, smiley, and that's it. And I, I, I really have the feeling like, did you understand this? And then, no, no hard feelings. And then they even come back and create some merge requests for other things. So it, it differs a lot. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so this one's answered. Uh, there's one question from Jefferson Masahiro Fujioka. I hope I'm saying the name right. Uh, can you tell us what are the pros and cons of a header only library? Okay, the pros. Um, the pros is I don't need to care about all the architectures out there. So if someone finds that Raspberry Pi with 32 bit, Linux, whatever, he can compile the library himself and it should work. I don't need to provide a binary for that. Um, so much about co shipping code versus uh, shipping shipping uh, libraries. Um, when it's about header only versus um, headers plus code, then I would say there are more disadvantages because headers, we use headers because we use templates a lot and compiling code with templates is very slow. And a lot of discussions is about this, that there, there is thing, I forgot the name. There's a website that shows how expensive it is to compile code with libraries included. And the library is there and it's not in a good shape. It takes a lot, it takes a few seconds to compile code where the library is used. So that is a big disadvantage that these compile times are really looking bad. So that would be a disadvantage. But at the same time, I know that technically there's no different solutions to that. If I want to use templates, I need to have a header only library. So I, I don't struggle too much that there are disadvantages. So, so to say, I don't care that because there's not a different way. If I would have another toy project where I would play around, I would try shipping binary libraries for a change to see whether this is the, the, bright, the bright path to follow, maybe eventually everything has so many pros and cons that we just have to deal with it. All right. Um, this one comes from Andy Sanders. So you mentioned communication of expectations. Can you share where you have documented quality expectations and what part, if any, do you consider most important in the codice analysis? Um, the expectations have not yet been documented. In fact, on my desktop is a list of to do's and that's part of that. So we have to overwork the contribution guide where we make it explicit. Right now it's implicit in the CI. So CI should be green and we added a lot of things to the CI. Part of that is codice. Um, the codice analyzes what I uh, value most is the fact that I have everything at one place compared to having specific tools being executed over the code base that spit out some warnings and then have a different tool for a different purpose and a, yet another tool. So with Codacy, it's like the one place to go. Um, it's, it's not perfect. It's not that, that I can could remove everything else, but it's always very good if, if I have a CI with a lot of red parts, I would always click first on codice to see it in the code directly in a, in a 
uh, in a web browser rather than to go through the logs that I get from other tools. But in the end, we try to put everything that we can on the code base that we can be sure that whatever tools other people use, we detect the errors first. So we try to use what if I if I if I enter C analyzes tool into Google, and if something is free, we try to add it to our CI because then we can expect other people to use it as well. That's that's the point. So it's it's not written down explicitly, but if I would write it down, the first thing is we expect that the CI uh, succeeds. Uh, it's over a hundred steps and it's it starts from compilers, but it goes to the point where we have a linter for the documentation. So if you add documentation and you don't have an example, then your CI doesn't pass because you better have an example if you write documentation. If you don't write documentation, the CI also doesn't pass because you should better write documentation. And we try to be as strict as possible, but we haven't written it down. But there we come to the point you have like single purpose project specific scripts and you have this C++ or Python or whatever quality tools. And I think on that part, tools like Codis are really helpful because I don't need to tell you what I'm looking for. I tell you, here's a project and you tell me what's wrong about it. And then we are talking, whereas the other stuff I really have to configure and it takes a long, lot of time. So it's it's a balance. Nice, really cool insight. A couple of people liked this question. Um, that was great, thank you. So there's an anonymous question here uh, with JSON being a hobby project. So you work on per fun, like you said. Uh, are scalability, security, and other production ready concerns, things you keep in mind when developing? And do you know if there are concerns for people who use the library? Um, scalability. As I said, C++ people are obsessed about um, performance. So we try to have it as fast and scalable as possible. Um, we are aware that we're not the fastest JSON library, but that's at the point not a, a scope of the project. So we are aware of it and we try to keep it in mind. But if I have the choice between making it faster and make it more user-friendly, I always would go for user-friendly because I personally think that if your JSON parsing code is a performance problem for your project, you shouldn't use JSON in the first place and not the library, but the data format. So I think we're in a space where performance is not neg neglectable, but it's not as important than onboarding people. If work, if you get a JSON object from an API and your job is to collect prices and return a sum of prices, you shouldn't need a lot of documentation and a PhD in computer science to do so. And this is where this library should be used. It's, we're not the one where you, you do this in microseconds. It's the one where you can do this in half an hour without looking at documentation. Or even if you look at documentation, you didn't do it in 10 minutes or so. So what's the next thing? Um, security. Um, we throw all the tools at it that we can. As I said, OSS fuss is at least trying to find all kind of buffer overflows, etc. when the parser is used. Um, we try to use as many tools as possible to detect things, but I would never go to the point where I say it's secure. Um, our process is way too naive for that. But at the same time, I haven't heard about specific security problems. So right now I would say, I don't know. Um, let's see where it brings us. So I can really only say I, I do my best, but I'm not an educated security engineer. So maybe I'm doing a lot of things wrong, but it's open source. And if people find issues, I'm happy to fix them. I'm happy to understand them. Um, and production ready concerns. I'm using the library myself in a lot of projects. So this dog fooding stuff works. If, if I see people struggling at work, I see that we're doing something wrong. So yes, this is all these, I take these concerns and I haven't really, the, the biggest concern I have when I announce a new version is that people come around and say, is it the fast and fastest JSON library? And then there's a discussion, which library of the week is the fastest, but I don't 
participate in these discussions, but everything else, I haven't seen problems uh, in the past. So I hope that this answers the question. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I answer very often depends or I don't know, but what should I do? Yeah, it's it's great. I think it's okay. We keep getting some more questions. So I'm just going to read uh, the next questions. Um, can you share some appreci appreciation you received, which you really liked? I'm not sure if that's possible, but if you can share what forms of support make most impact to open source projects? Um, I had one there. When Google started with OSS Fuzz, they um, had a special budget for projects participating and um, they integrated the projects themselves, created an account for me and suddenly these bugs came in. And I found it interesting and fixed the first one. And then I got money from Google from, from a bug bounty program that I wasn't even aware of. So I was fixing a bug in my code base and Google said, oh, you, you, you fixed a project in our bug bounty program, here's some money. And uh, that was the first time I received money for an open source project and was also, I wasn't aware of it at all. And suddenly it's about Google reaching out and, and that, that was really great because it was the first time I, I saw that there is an overlap between writing software in your free time and, and maybe getting money. And uh, that, that was one thing. And another thing I really enjoy, um, I like Google sponsors, but Google sponsors lacks one thing that PayPal has. You can write a message to it. And sometimes I get from people like $1.50 or something with a message, hi, this is, I don't know, this is Julia from New York, like your library, buy you a coffee. And this, it's not about the money, it's just about people doing this. Also people writing email, just no money involved at all. Just saying, I'm doing this and this, your library helped me, just wanted to reach out, Thanks a lot. Or sometimes if you're ever in, I don't know, Istanbul, let me know if we can have a beer, something like this. I, I, I really enjoy this thing. And um, that kind of appreciation is really nice to see that it's, it's not robots downloading the library. It's really people and it's actually helpful. Yeah, it truly feels like a community. We keep getting more questions. Let's go for the next one. Um, this one is from Stylo Shepherd. Uh, have you tried providing an open hour, uh, like monthly, for people to get in touch uh, interactively uh, with contributors and teaming up or celebrating the release? That's a good question. Uh, thanks, Tilo. I, I haven't thought about this. And right now, I wouldn't, I, I could try it, I think, so to say. Right now, I don't have a dedicated channel to reach people. So it's, that, then again, that's something with GitHub. Um, you can have, the, in discussions, you can pin discussions, but there's no way to say, to put a message out to the people who come to the project. So if I would announce that I would do this like every, I don't know, every third Thursday in the month, I have no idea how to reach the people. So I would need to pin it into the readme and wait for a long time, hopefully seeing people. I don't have a channel to do this, but I think it could be nice. and. Yeah, now that we have Discord or something, it could be easy to get into touch interactively. Good question. Thanks a lot. And I'll think about it and see what I can do. This regular stuff, that is once again the stuff where I'm hesitant because I can't promise what I do next week or next year or not next year, next, next month. But it could be that at that point in time, I have no time to do so. And then it feels like an obligation and then it's not fun anymore. So let's see. All right. Uh, yeah, this has been answered. A um, couple more anonymous questions. So do you have plans to start another open source project? I did. I do have some open source projects in my GitHub. It's just that nobody cares. Um, no, no, it's um, as for a lot of things, I like this quote, like um, good artists steal, great artists ship or whatever. I'm not exactly, but this shipping stuff, this getting things done is important. And that's why there are some side projects I have that end up in GitHub. I don't expect anyone to use them, but I like that since I'm ready with it and I'm happy with it to have it out, out there, but 
it's not anything that I can plan. I can't sit down and say, let's write another project that a lot of people use. I think this could also be the wrong mindset to, to start a project. You can start a company like that, but it's not that I sit down and plan this. So I do have other open source projects. I would like to do more because then again, if there's a new Visual Studio compiler coming out and you know there will be bugs coming in because of some warnings, that is the point in time where I just want to run and just start something new. But then again, if you see then again, these motivating emails, et cetera, then you come back and then you figure your day only has 24 hours. So I think it's, I think once Jason, if, if nobody is using it anymore and I can get rid of it, then it's time to start new things. Right now, I, I don't have the time for that. Yeah, no. fair enough. Yeah. So any plans to port it to Rust? There is this smiley at the end of it. No, there are no plans. Uh, I tried to learn Rust when there was the last event of code, but it's not a language for me yet, maybe in the future, but I, I, I really hope that Rust already has a JSON parser. I really hope that they're not waiting for people like me who teach themselves Rust by, by parsing JSON. No, <laughs> not really. Okay, okay. So I think we have a few minutes just for the last two questions. Um, May I, so someone is asking, may I ask you to think an open source project maintainer uh, would be hard to against those open source projects that are using parts of your code without claiming they're using your work? I don't know. Um, I think that none of the things that we're doing are worth stealing. It's not that we invented anything. It's not that we do something that nobody else could have come up with. I think the value of the library is not some lines of code that you copy paste. It's more the, the documentation, the fact that it runs anywhere, the fact that it doesn't have warnings, et cetera. So if people take codes, et cetera, I, I, I don't think that anyone can steal some things and get rich and famous with the stuff. And I would sit there and say, oh, I did this originally. So basically, I'm, I, I don't care. But I do think definitely this, this would be a problem. And if I would find out, then I would definitely reach out to the people, especially since I know that in, in professional um, context, people use um, all kinds of tools to check for licenses, to check for exactly these situations. And I don't want. I don't want to come up in these kind of code checks. I don't want to have anyone have a library and then suddenly my code is in that library and then someone feels that I should maintain this or I'm responsible for this. So I don't think this, it, it's bad style at minimum and uh, theft at best. So no, uh, I, I don't like this, but I don't, I'm not afraid. I don't think that anyone can take this away. All right, thank you. Last question, and I think we'll need to wrap up after this one. So any company try to hire you, hire you because of your JSON project? I don't know. <laughs> I know that uh, in the last company that I started working with that the people who interviewed me were aware of this because of course I'm writing it in my CV, but I really hope that they didn't hire me just because of this. Uh, especially since now I'm not doing this. I mean, it would be different if someone would play with open cards and say your libraries, well, it's not important enough. But I know that people like like um, Daniel Steinberg who's doing libcurl, he's working in companies that use libcurl and that they really want to pay money for him to develop it. Um, sometimes people on LinkedIn or uh, so write to me that they, with great interest, I see your GitHub projects, et cetera, but I don't have the feeling that they really understand what I'm doing because then they offer me jobs for Rust or Java or whatever. So uh, it's not too helpful. Um, but then again, I, it's definitely in my CV because uh, as, a, as a developer, I think this, is, this should be the new things that you can show what you're doing. It's, it's, get, it's, it's, it's easier to, to, to show that you can program, et cetera, with open source projects than with just having, I don't know, having a degree somewhere or or having worked in, in a company for a while, because that sometimes 
can mean that you're good at writing emails or good at attending meetings, but not really at writing software. Okay, um, that's a good idea. And thank you for answering all these questions. Uh, we are going to close the Q&A. Uh, just thank you so much, Jaime and Niels. Uh, for the insightful discussion. And before we go, I just want to end this with a quick poll. Um, oh, let me see if I can get this in front of you. Uh, yeah, here you go. So we just want to know very quickly, just if after this talk, will you be more interested in joining an open source, the open source community? Has this changed anything for you? Uh, all right, so let's end the poll. And I can share the results with you, uh, which I think you can see now. Basically, a lot of people say they're already part of the community, but also 58% of people. So most, most people here say that they're, they are more interested in, in the open source community. Um, so that's pretty cool. Let's stop sharing That's this. definitely because of uh, Niels answering all these questions. Thank you, Niels. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and yeah, so don't worry, everyone, we will be sharing a recording of this with you uh, after the session so you can look back if you missed anything. And if you can, please take time to take uh, to answer the quick survey at the end of this as soon as we close. Um, but I think uh, that's it for us and we hope to see you at the next webinar. We do webinars every month. So stick around to see um, what the next webinar is going to be about. Well, thank you again, Jaime and Niels. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Thanks. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.